Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to today's webinar on the intersection of holistic advice and best interest. Uh, we're going to begin in just a few minutes. Uh, please hold on for a moment while we, while, while we allow a few more folks to join, and uh, we'll get started shortly. Thank you. All right, uh, good afternoon again, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on the intersection of holistic advice and best interest. Uh, my name is Tim Carer. I'm the Director of Research at Caribbean Research and Consulting, and we're pleased to be hosting today's webinar. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do so without the support of our sponsors. Um, the sponsors for today's event are Capital Rock, InvestNet Money Guide, the Retirement Learning Center, and Riskalyze. Uh, we'd also like to thank our friends at Midwood for their support of today's event. Uh, thanks to you all. Um, today's uh, conversation is a continuation of one that we started a few months ago um, around the role that financial planning uh, is playing in our businesses today uh, uh, with a focus on uh, the role that it's playing uh, uh, in uh, the midst of the crisis, um, and uh, the role that it's uh, going to play in the future. Um, the, we host all of our webinars um, and uh, all of our study groups, too, uh, uh, for the benefit of the audience. Um, and we believe that the benefit to you all uh, who've tuned in today will be greatly enhanced if you join the conversation. Uh, we've given you a couple of ways to do that. Um, one is by uh, clicking the uh, raise your hand button uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, that'll uh, send a little message to me. It'll uh, allow me to bring you uh, into our virtual panel today. Um, uh, uh, you'll be on audio uh, as well as video if you're set up to do that. Uh, give you a chance to ask your question um, and uh, have, a little, uh, have a little back and forth with our, uh, with our, our virtual study group. Um, if you uh, prefer, you can also uh, submit questions uh, via the chat function. Uh, but we do, uh, either way that you choose to, uh, uh, we uh, would really like for you to, uh, 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 to be part of the conversation today. Uh, there, uh, we have invited uh, a few of your peers from um, uh, around the industry to join us on the screen today. Um, they are Amanda Dema from BMO Wealth Management, Connor Thomas from Capital Rock, Kevin Larson from Satera Financial Group, Paul Haynes from Middleburg Financial, Will Gilfillan from InvestNet Money Guide, John Carl from the Retirement Learning Center, and Dana Rhodes from Risk Allies. Thanks to you all for joining. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so that uh, you can see um, all of our faces at once. Um, a reminder to everybody on the panel, you are muted. 
So when you're ready to uh, jump in and kick us off, please, uh, please take yourself off mute. Thanks. Well, good, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Um, no, thank you all for joining. I think one of the things that we just wanted to kick it off with was um, we believe that financial planning is the core to um, delivering holistic advice. And so I wanted to start it off with a question, is financial planning enough? Yes. Am, 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 am Liam, I, I'm, I'm, there you go. Okay. There you go. Um, I actually got a few letters before the before the uh, meeting when we sent the invitations out, uh, asking that very question. In fact, uh, one of them was from our good friend uh, Richard Feder from uh, 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 Fort Lee, New Jersey, and he wrote, "You know, my advisors make all their recommendations based on their client's financial plan. Aren't I fully compliant with Reg BI?" What, uh, 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 how would you all respond to that? Well, I, I can go, um, no, you're not. I mean, financial planning is just a part of the process. Um, you know, when you think about, when you take a step back and look at Reg BI, you've got policies and procedures, you've got conflicts of interest. All of those are separate and distinct and different from financial planning. Um, I actually remember being on a panel with Peter uh, Valen years ago when, when the Department of Labor was, was first coming out with their fiduciary rule five, six years ago. And we were talking about financial planning even way back then as, as a baseline that we use to help support our ongoing fiduciary responsibilities. It doesn't, it doesn't meet all the requirements, but it's, I think it's the entry point to start the process down the road. I mean, Amanda, what's your take on that? She's on myself there. Uh, so I agree. I think it's a great baseline. Um, obviously, with Reg BI, there are disclosures that also need to be delivered. The form CRS, and um, and on brokerage accounts, we need to also deliver the the Reg BI disclosures um, that are prepared either by your firm or that you would have to prepare on your own if you're, if you're a solo um, registered rep. Uh, so the other thing that I would note is beyond those basic requirements is once you've made your recommendation, it may be based off of information that you've collected and you've documented, but that you also need to substantiate the recommendation um, through through note taking. And so that is a really key element um, so that even though you have prepared a financial plan um, for, for your clients, that on each recommendation that you make, um, there can't be any replacement as well for, um, for great documentation as to your reasoning for making those recommendations, even though you have the financial plan as the basis. Um, at, at BMO, how do you record those? Those? How do you document that? In Salesforce or some other tool? Yes, yes. So we use Salesforce at BMO, um, and that is the the basis for all of the documentation that our financial advisors use. We've come up with a couple of keywords for uh, for the advisors to put within um, the subject line. Um, so when they've delivered a form CRS um, or they've delivered the, the, the best interest disclosure document, um, they would put in hashtag um, CRS or hashtag uh, BI. And then that is a, a way to, um, it's a way for BMO supervisors to, to search for those notes. Um, and then we did the same thing with hold recommendations. So if you're going to make a hold recommendation, you need to put the same time and thought and energy that goes into a hold recommendation as you would into a buy or sell recommendation as well. So we came up with the, the subject line of hashtag hold. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that in your shop, Paul? Well, I think, um, 
you know, a lot of great comments were made, and and the the real fundamental question is: is the financial plan a deliverable or is it a process? And we tend to believe that it's a process, which um, when you break it down in, in real simple terms, and, and I'm probably going to sound like a little bit of a broken record because I'll just keep referencing the same thing. You know, we look at we look at the financial planning process as really four parts. First, the discovery fact finding process, because that's such a big component of Reg BI, getting to know your client. Um, before I move on to the second part, let me just touch on this. We, we've turned this into a real positive going to, to the bank and saying, you know, in the past, just a simple referral would have been just fine. We could run with it. Now, you know, thanks to companies like Amazon, and I know that gets thrown out and used, but it's a reality. What we've quickly discovered um, during this financial planning process is, is if we're asking our clients basic questions, that we should already know because we're part of a, a bank that already has this information, it's not a very good client experience. So we've been able to, to use this as a way to work with the bank collaboratively to, to gather, I'd say, a, a higher level of information than we've been able to get in the past in terms of the referrals. And, and in the process of doing that, it's encouraged our bank partners to, to do more of the data gathering process and ask the right types of questions. Um, the second piece of that is our design process for the plan, making sure that we're covering everything that the client indicated in terms of goals and then everything we need to, to cover from a, uh, from a regulatory standpoint. But also in the, in the design process, we're looking at ways to holistically look at the client. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we're looking at uh, something like cash flow or debt management, I think these are two things that are very, very, very important that often get overlooked by a financial advisor just focused on investments. We want to outsource that to the, the right banker, whether it be the private bank or a premier banker with, the, with our consumer bank, and, and move back to, to what we do real well as a subject matter expert. The other two parts, the implementation, you know, there, there's some new guidelines and rules that was already touched on. I don't feel like I need to cover what was already eloquently said. And then the, the constant monitoring of the plan. So we've got um, really not just our team, but the whole bank kind of working on these four parts. And what we've seen is um, not just a, a comfort level with, with are we fulfilling our regulatory requirements, but, but really a, a, a teaming approach and um, a hypersensitivity to gathering as much information as we can about the client. And then in the process of doing that, we're learning the bank, the client in, in a much more efficient and uh, holistic way. But how do you warehouse and document that? That information. Oh, definitely through our, our CRM tools. Uh, we, we use a, a TPM Raymond James, which makes it very, very easy for us to, to integrate um, the CRM, the new, new account opening process, the financial planning tools. I mean, it's, it's, it's all integrated. But uh, yeah, as part of our implementation process, we're making sure that, that the documentation is there and that's something that we monitor and, and supervise. Well, Amanda, I have a question for you. Um, do you guys still, at one point, I think you were requiring a financial plan, even though it wasn't all that was required. I mean, it was just part of what everything that you were requiring for that. And this was in the DOL. Uh, this wasn't Reg BI, you know, but is that still something that BMO is requiring? They're not requiring it. Um, it's heavily encouraged. I think one of the things that they found is that not every client needs a financial plan. Um, and so while they heavily encourage financial planning to be the basis of each of their relationships, um, that requiring it could get them into trouble um, from an audit perspective and, um, and a compliance perspective. Gee, gee Will didn't, uh, doesn't, Money Guide always preach that everyone needs a quality financial plan? Uh, yes, although, Ken, I might um, just kind of back up what Amanda said. There, there are different ways of serving a customer. Um, the customer may work with numerous institutions for different parts of their financial life. So uh, for whomever controls that sort of central hub of the relationship and really is that primary trusted advisor, we, we think those people should be delivering a plan. Um, for anyone else who may be on the periphery of that, uh, they're probably providing a valuable service on some level, but you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense for them to be 
the one who delivers it. And you know, that can depend on myriad factors uh, with the relationship. But um, you know, I might also say that obviously we would love to tell everyone here that uh, the, the plan solves your, your Reg BI and compliance problems. But um, we, we really tend to look at it as a way to shore up uh, the recommendation that you have made, it does create a nice record of really why recommendations were given and, and when they were given. Um, and it doesn't solve for everything, but it's, it's pretty powerful stuff to have on record. And so especially when you've got uh, systems like ours or, or other planning softwares integrated with the CRMs, uh, with Salesforce, your, uh, as well as your investment uh, proposal systems and such, you're, you're doing a great job for yourself just in keeping those records, uh, shoring things up. And, you know, if you don't have the same level of plan engagement for every client that you deliver it to, that's okay. I mean, we know there are nuances in, in how much planning is delivered per client. But the, the place that is not nuanced is those clients who do need a plan from you and have received really nothing of that type. So that's more who we're worried about and who we think there's, you know, there's some exposure there. So I'll just kind of wrap up by saying even uh, doing the basic data discovery process in Money Guide, whether it's, you know, you don't have to get all the way to a result and goals, just knowing who they are, cataloging that and saving that information in Money Guide and the CRM, it's going to be really helpful. It was, it was, I noted you, you, you mentioned it's sort of different between whether you're central to the to the client or whether you're on the periphery of the client's financial life. Um, I think, I think Tim, you might chime in on our research that, that we found that the way you get out of the periphery and into the center is by doing the plan. Do you have, do you have some of those, those numbers at your fingertips? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, what, what Ken is referring to is that um, in our study of consumer financial behavior, there's almost a 100% correlation or overlap between where the household got their financial plan and who the household considers to be its primary advisor. Um, now, you know, of course, there's a chicken and an egg thing going on here. Uh, it's hard to say uh, one way or the other uh, 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 whether the financial plan came first or that um, uh, uh, the sort of sense of primacy, the perception of who, who, who the household Kind of thinks of as being their primary advisor, um, but nonetheless, I mean the the correlation is 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 through the roof. You rare, rarely see that level of correlation in the in the type of data work that we do. And then we also see then the assets flow to the person who did the plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, Lee. Yep. So actually, I was going to ask Connor because I know we've had a lot of conversations. And you've got a really solid philosophy that I, I thought the folks would find interesting. Yeah, I think you're, you're probably talking about, I, I've always said there's kind of the three things that you need that make up a little bit of a, uh, a stool, so to speak, on making sure that you're on solid footing when it comes to any type of best interest rule. And I think the, you know, the, <clears throat> could you stand up on two without financial planning? Probably by meeting bare minimum standards. But you really should have three, and that, that still becomes possible when you have those three legs. And so one of those legs that I've mentioned is, is planning, and that's going to be pretty much academically showing that the client's financial situation is bettered by the action that you take. Uh, two is, and banks do a really great job of this compared to some of the other broker-dealer types out there, is having a, a very carefully curated shelf of products, meaning that if you pick a product off the shelf, it's going to be a product that there's been some really solid due diligence on, you're unlikely to pick a clunker. Banks do a pretty good job of making sure that they're selling the top products. And then the third piece of the puzzle is something that neither of those things can do, and that's go through the pre-sale compliance and suitability process. And so you can show that someone's financial plan is made better with a certain product, uh, and it, it, it may very well be better, but there could be a compliance rule that precludes that sale from going forward. So I really think that when you combine uh, a tool like what Rightbridge can do, and, and there are others out there, to be able to say, these are the questions that you need to have answered. This is the information that you need to get from your clients. And I think one of our strong value propositions is automatically generating reasons why. Uh, I'm sure we'll venture into the new proposed DOL rule 
Um, but I really think that they stole some lines out of our marketing because they say you need to document specific reasons why the rollover was in the client's best interest. And that's something that we do automatically. So I really feel if you have all three of those things uh, that you are on really solid footing. And I think, you know, we're talking a little bit of research that uh, something that I see pretty regularly is it's not generally your client that will challenge a sale. It's your client's estate. And so five years from now, three years from now, if somebody comes to you and says, why did you sell this to my family member? What do you want to have on file? And I think if you have all three of those things, you, you have a really good fighting chance. Amanda, I'd love to hear uh, what your thoughts are on that. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, definitely, you cannot do any or make any type of recommendation without going through the suitability analysis. Um, and, and again, I think documentation of that analysis is key. Um, so, you know, because you do at some point um, want to make sure that you can prove up, you know, what your what recommendation you you made at the time, um, because, you know, it's one thing to go back and try and and piecemeal it together from a historical perspective and, and a backward looking um, perspective. But then you have, you know, the hindsight is 2020 argument that can also be made at that same time. And it's and so if you if you don't take notes or keep a record of why you made a certain recommendation, um, it's gonna be a lot easier for somebody to make that counter argument of the hindsight position um, of whatever has taken and you know, whatever has occurred in the future state. Well, that's great, thanks. You know, one of the things that, oh yeah, Paul, or, yeah, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a comment. I, 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 I'm smiling a little bit because now I'm on the TPM side, but you know, kind of looking at it from when we were our own BD and the amount of work, just, just on that second thing that you mentioned, Connor, which is the shelf of products. I mean, seven years ago when I, when I got into the management of our own BD, it was, all right, is this product, will this product basically meet a suitability, suitability type um, challenge? And the answer was for the majority of them, yes, and, and if, if it worked for the client in that situation. Then the DOL rule came along, and then all of a sudden it's like, hold on a second. I went from 80% sales to probably 80% just administering the business, and it became quite burdensome. So, you know, I think what, what's important for these meetings is, is yeah, when you're, when you're talking about the planning, the shelf of products, all that goes into meeting with legal, I mean, this uh, CRS form, I remember in the, the, the DOL, we spent hours and hours and hours, and a colleague who, who's his own BD told me he spent over 120 hours writing it. You know, I'm, I'm happy to say I got this, and we had a 30-minute call about what it said, and boom, that was it, you know. So um, I'm, I, I'm now being on this side, it, it's a lot more fun to be to spend the majority of my time on the sales side and, and let – all you smart people who are on the panel and on this call uh, who handled the back office, handled the products, handled the, the, the rule making, the compliance, the supervision. Um, so anyway, I don't know why I was inspired to share that, but thought it was thought it was a appropriate time to just give two perspectives. And I do think that it's it's really helpful when you have an organization that does a lot of that legwork for you, right? And that gives you the tools to be able to comply, um, you know, sort of a second nature rather than, um, you know, when you're doing it all yourself. So if, if you have to do perform the due diligence on your own, um, that can be a lot more daunting um, than when you have a firm that supports you and, and does the due diligence on your behalf. Um, and then you can, you know that there's a baseline suitability um, requirement that's met, and then you really need to just ensure that it's suitable um, for your client um, at that time. So Amanda, I feel like, um, so I know BMO uses Riskalyze. Does that, I mean, that's part of what, or excuse me, take that back, sorry, apologies. Um, I meant um, the annuity wizard, right? Right, right, first. right yes. To in the product selection? Yes. So yes, I guess 
where I was going with this is like, how do we help advisors make the product selection based on now everything else that they've, you know, they've done the profiling and now we're trying to figure out what the best fit is for the client. Well, you know, this probably isn't the best question for me to answer, um, okay. being on the legal side, uh, the financial planning aspect and the, the due diligence that goes in, um, you know, I'm there looking at it at the end, you know, when we're deciding to put on a, or add a new product. Um, so that's really my role um, is to ask questions and make sure that it is suitable at the end, but the upfront due diligence is not something I'm a part of. Sure. Paul? Well, one, one thing I just wanted maybe to throw out to the panel as well, because I, I know on the, the management side, there's really a fine line between two things. One is having enough product, uh, having enough leeway to do certain types of investments and the types of strategies. And then the other line is being compliant and not being too aggressive. And, and I say that because if you don't have enough, if you don't have enough product, if you don't have enough strategy, but everybody else is, because, you know, I've, I've been on that side where we've taken an extremely competitive approach. Now, all of a sudden, you've got every competitor calling your advisors like, I can't believe you all are not allowing this. We do. Come on over here. And, and then on the flip side, if you're too aggressive, you know, you, you, you got to worry about all the regulators. And so you don't want that either. So, um, you know, I, I know Amanda was, for several very objective reasons, kind of not, not specifically answering that question, but I, I get what she's saying, definitely, because, uh, you know, you, you have to weigh in that, that legal, but, but still be competitive. So I like, I like the outsourcing to, to those who've already done the due diligence, who know what's allowable, which products work and what scenarios. And then, and then you, you almost, you know, uh, outsource that, that responsibility in, in, in some ways. Is Kevin on the call? Uh, Kevin hasn't uh, jumped yeah. in the conversation yet. Yeah, so if, if the question really is around different types of products that are being up front, um, we really, so getting back to what some of the due diligence was, we really tried to think about, do I really care if it's a Jackson National Variable Annuity or Prudential Variable Annuity or, you know, whatever those products are, I, I really don't care from my standpoint. We've really tried to really levelize the compensation, remove the conflicts of interest. That way the representative can actually sit down and think about what works what works best for that client. In their area, they may have a really good wholesaler, let, let's just say, and I'm just throwing out names, so it could be ABC company, and they've got a really good wholesaler in their area, and they may sell that product because they've got local support. And, and what we've tried to do is really pull those conflicts out and up front and, and allow that representative to make those, those choices up front. Now what we do on the backside is we start looking at the whole cash, non-cash compensation, because we want to look for those types of conflicts to see if a rep is getting too much of that compensation for seminars and things along those lines. So we, we try and take some control points on the backside to also look for that, but give those reps up front that opportunity. And I, I saw the news this week that uh, Merrill Lynch is, is, yep. has uh, yeah. clamped down on, the, on those perks. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and there's going to be more of that because of the, uh, from a concern from my standpoint is uh, we're in a very conflicted environment. Um, all of those are conflicts. And how do we really think about what's in the best interest of the client is, is eliminating those conflicts. So that way a rep isn't enticed to sell certain products to maybe get a trip to Ireland or something to that effect. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, now Ken, you know, just to follow up on that, um, as more regulations come out, as you know, we anticipate they will over the course of time, or states get more involved, it does become more difficult for firms to have a long laundry list of products on their shelf because advisors have to know all those products. And some of them can be very complicated and you know, they really need to understand it. So um, as firms tend to shrink that product list and as direct delivery firms of investment services continue to increase, um, advisors in our world need to find ways to separate themselves and what they offer to the clients because it can't just be product. And this is where planning comes back into the scheme of things is that it's going to become even more difficult for advisors to be able to show their ability 
if they're only able to work with selection of investment products. And a client is going to look for a heck of a lot more than that. So we've got to make the investment part as streamlined as possible, as accurate as possible, do as great a job as we possibly can, but not get bogged down, you know, and not without technology, we will get bogged down, but so not get bogged down in, the, in that part of the business so that we can devote our efforts to the broader financial and need space part of that client relationship. So I got a quick thing. Um, in, in, full, in full disclosure, I didn't know Connor was going to be on the call today. Um, and, and in full disclosure, at Satera Investment Services, we actually use a couple of um, products from Capital Rock. One of, one of them is their suggestion engine, and one of them is their rollover wizard. So we actually, so full disclosure to everyone. Um, I've been actually touting their, their suggestion engine for, for years, because what their suggestion engine, and Connor, if there's a different name for it, I apologize, you're gonna have to tell me what it is. No, no, but that's one. You get it. Was that? Then you got it, that's the one. Okay, it literally sits on top of our database of all the client information, and what it'll do is literally run suggestions for that client. And in a, in a, on a daily basis, annual basis, we, we actually tell our representatives to actually run this report. And it runs a suggestion of all the client information we have on them, age and makes all these suggestions, 25 suggestions. And to literally print that off and sit down with our clients on an annual basis saying, hey, we're using a third party tool. This is all the information we have on you. It's saying you're 65, you gotta do, we gotta talk about long-term care insurance. Or it shows, hey, you only have fifty thousand dollars. Where's the rest of your assets at? So we can start talking about retirement income planning. And we tell the reps then to then print that off, keep it electronically to help build that um, that support. Because while financial planning is appropriate, and I would even define out financial planning is different. You can have a goals-based plan, which um, and and again, there's a lot of good technology out there. We use Money Guide Pro and we use their blocks quite a bit. Um, you can do certain blocks within 10 minutes and just do a very basic goals planned all the way up to a 300 page report. Um, to me, from a, on the legal side, yeah, that's why we try and make product agnostic so we can build in those planning elements to, to build the controls and the, the protection from the BI, mm -hmm. whether it's DOL tomorrow or it's the SEC in three years, who knows, um, to build those protections in. One of the things I wanted to also talk about as far as this is risk, right? Um, I've seen a lot of different firms have risk tolerance questionnaires to try to assess risk. And some of them are four questions. And some of them are like, I don't know, maybe I've seen, you know, 10, 12, 15 questions. It's like, and, you know, can clients really answer those and, you know, and really be able to assess their risk? Do you feel like your risk tolerance uh, assessment tools are adequate? So I don't know, Kevin, what you guys do for... <laughs> I was hoping someone else would answer. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's challenging. Um, when, it, when anyone, someone says, can a client actually go through 10 questions and actually understand and comprehend the results of that? No, they can't. Um, and a lot of times, um, you know, it's... Uh, I, I think the, honestly, to me, the more simple you can make it from a client standpoint and literally, hey, client, are you, are you okay losing 5% of your portfolio or making 5% versus you slide something over? Are you okay losing 50% and making 50%? No, by the way, here are the numbers. Clients, I think, can understand that to, to walk them through some type of, I, I haven't seen a really good 10 questionnaire that a client mm -hmm. can actually walk through, answer all of that, and truly understand how they got to that point. So I feel like Kevin just described Riskalyze for everyone. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Dude, I didn't know that. Cash. I mean, I, I, I wasn't. Um, <laughs> but no, to your point, Lee, what we've seen, and and I, my background, I've been with Riskalyze for a couple of years, but prior to that, I was in the home office of uh, a large independent dealer and dealing with these types of questions and questions and what we see often is um, you know these questions that are very subjective to the client and you know the the questions around you know um, how much would you be willing to lose from a $300,000 portfolio 
I've seen something like that, right? And $300,000 means something very different to everybody on this call and to everybody in the world. And so it's really difficult to personalize that. And so um, that's what we really tried to do with um, the risk number is make it something that clients can understand, right? The faster you go, the more aggressive you are, the faster you may reach your goals, but you also may crash and burn. Um, what we found is terms like moderate, or moderately conservative or aggressive, uh, they mean so many different subjective things. Um, the other interesting tidbit that we've seen is that sometimes when you're using those types of questionnaires, they can also be influenced by the advisor. Um, we've seen advisors that come in and they bring in their portfolios and maybe they get their risk number and they're a 35 or a 50 and then Randomly, all of their models seem to have a similar risk number and all of their clients sort of end up aligning with their risk. So we've taken that approach of, just as Kevin described, how much do you have to invest and how much are you willing to lose in the short term? The reason we say the short term is because while they're all, they all want financial plans, they all should probably have a financial plan, they make bad decisions in the short term. They don't make bad decisions looking at their long-term plan. They get panicked by a pandemic and make bad investing decisions or panicked by whatever the scenario may be. So we really try to take a very um, client-centric, personalized approach that makes sense to the most um, novice investor, but also translates to the more expert investor. And certainly you can supplement with other additional questions. But to your point, I do think it's hard with just a 10-question standard questionnaire something that really applies across that full group. Paul? Huh? I, I, there's, there's definitely a, an art and a science to it. Um, how you can successfully marry the two, I think, is using the, the tools that are available to you. So, for instance, using a um, Monte Carlo analysis, you know, the, the, the client may have filled out a questionnaire saying, I'm not very risk, or I'm very risk averse. I don't want to take on a lot of risk. And then you show them the probability of success in retirement mm -hmm. given their current situation, and it's like 35%. So then you say, all right, well, let's, let's give you your options to improve your plan. In retirement, do you want to live on a smaller budget? Do you perhaps want to work longer, which would mm -hmm. also influence it? Do you want to tighten the belt mm -hmm. now and improve your cash flow to put more, more money in? Or do you want to try and up your risk tolerance to, to get a higher rate of return on your investment? Well, now all of a sudden, the path of least resistance or the, the, the easiest is, well, let, let's just let my investments go to work for me. And, and now all of a sudden, that, that risk questionnaire is obsolete, <laughs> you know, given those options. So I think, it, I think it's very, very important to use the tools. You're, 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 you're gathering data from so many different places, but um, what, what makes a really good financial advisor, financial planner, is the one who recognizes the, the narrative and can kind of lead the client to their options and then really ascertain what the what the right answer is because yeah, I mean, how would you feel if you lost 30%? Well, I don't know, never really lost 30%. You, you start to show them and then, and then, well, this is the impact. Now you'd have to work two years longer or three years longer. Well, I don't like that. You know, it, they went from very risky to risk adverse, just like that. So just, just an example. Paul, I love what you and mentioned that, there. Something Lee and I actually talked about last week, which is um, it's that, that risk capacity conversation, right? And it's, understanding, while I may think that I'm a 37, but I need to be a 65 to get to my goals and understanding that, that risk reward um, uh, give and take. And it's something that as we talk about this financial planning discussion and you know, does everyone need a plan? I think we all said they probably should, but in reality, they're probably not all going to get a plan. Even the most financial planning centric advisors are not doing plans and going to that level with every single client. And so um, that's why we do have a retirement map tool that does exactly what you're talking about, shows you those potential outcomes um, along the way with various recommendations, with current portfolios, um, gives you just a little light uh, diet planning, if you will, um, and, and helps you sort of have those conversations more easily with the client if they do need to take on more risk. And then you've got that light planning you've provided that you can then integrate into a full-blown um, financial plan if it makes sense for that client, but you still have a little something extra to cover that conversation and that recommendation for you. Yeah, I, I do a lot of plan reviews and I've literally reviewed thousands of, of plans at this point, but I know before I was an advisor previous uh, and 
it used to be that we, before I even could use financial planning software, we would go through the risk tolerance questionnaire and it was only when the client lost money that they understood when risk was too much, right? It was after they lost their money, then they were like, oh, I don't like this, but you can't go back. So I started, um, I started saying, well, we're going to answer, you know, we're going to go through this risk assessment and then we're just going to back it off. Like I'll say, we're going to, I'd rather we go up in, you know, risk than to start too high and then go backwards because going backwards is not a pleasant conversation. Right? So, but now the dilemma I have is when I'm coaching and uh, either managers or advisors is I see advisors and they have the client's risk profile in retirement as capital growth. And I'm like, wait, that, you know, this is like, and I know this, these are just kind of all, you know, it's all relative terms. Like what is even, what does capital growth mean? I mean, kind of like a really high equity portfolio. And I'm like, well, when you're 80 years old, are you going to really want that amount of risk? Where I'm trying to get to is how do we, you know, easily determine if a client's taking on too much risk? I think that's a challenge. But I think, Dane, if I'm right, I think Riskalyze has the ability to try to say, if we've gone through a risk assessment, we kind of understand their risk and we can, we can e more easily see if they're taking on too much risk. Is, is that right? Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, so I think what's um, unique to what we're doing um, relative to some other um, software systems that assess risk is that um, we're looking at it all through that same lens. So we're looking at a client's appetite for risk, with the risk questionnaire through that risk number lens, but then it translates across to portfolio recommendations um, down to the position level. So it's a nuance that I don't think a lot of folks realize. Um, I know just back in my former life, I ran into advisors coming to me in the home office saying, hey, such security, it shows up in this, you know, Morningstar box, but this isn't exactly right. It really looks more like this. And you had all these securities I called the tweener securities that were really hard to score. Um, and our unique risk and methodology, we're scoring every single security. We're not scoring it based on how its asset class behaves. We're scoring it based on how that underlying security, that individual security behaves. And so we can actually get a sense of, okay, if you're a risk 47, here's how your portfolio and the underlying securities within it um, behaved and we can actually score it down to each security. It makes the conversation with the client a little more easy for the advisor because instead of him having to talk about alpha, beta, R squared, sharp ratio, all of sort of those MPA stats that we all want to go toward because that's what we see and what we know, they can say, look, you've got this risk 94 um, equity in your portfolio, it's driving up that overall risk. It's making you go faster than you want. And it makes it a, a much easier conversation to have with a lay person. Yeah, I think that's just one of the, the challenges is trying to get the client's risk aligned with, you know, the recommendation. It, that's kind of where I was going with that. So yeah, Paul. I just I just want to piggyback on that and add, I mean, because I always feel like these forms are good for best practices, right? But also to challenge some some things. Um, what worked for me really well as an advisor back before the Great Recession, and then, and then continuing as a manager to help help the clients is let me take let me take everybody back to that first example. Let's say we walk the client through four options: less, working longer, improving cash flow, or taking on more risk, and they choose to take on more risk. Well. Now I have a financial plan where I'm going to have to drift a little bit from the, the, the recommendation to, to, to increase some risk, but I'm going to document that. Now, what I'm also going to document is plan B, because I think this is what's really, really important is what if we don't get the right rate of return? What if it is right before the Great Recession? What if, you know, we don't get the, the average rate of return we need on the investments? Well, we already have it documented. The client has agreed by taking on this risk, they're willing to work another three years, which using the financial planning software we showed that would that would cover it or um, spend less or you know look look to tighten the belt. So uh, and, and I would also say not only does that cover from a regulatory standpoint, but you go back to the client experience. When things don't go according to plan, the client's 
panicking and you just kind of remind them, hey, we, we talked about this. We, we said what, what's plan B. <laughs> we don't have to discuss it right now when, when you're, you're panicked. We talked about it when things were calm and you could objectively look at things and you said you would work a few years longer and let's just make that the current plan and if things improve, then we can go back to what plan A is, so. In, in, embedded in these, these models, of course, are certain capital market assumptions. It's not clear that the advisors are really on top of what, what's in there. Leave, you had a lot of experience looking at that. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I've, in several firms, I've seen firms that have capital market assumptions that are so um, conservative that like they have a tough time showing their clients that they can even retire. And then in that particular case, the advisors, they, they're not, they're like, I can't use this planning tool because our cap because our capital market assumptions are so conservative that I can never show my clients succeeding. On the flip side, I've seen firms where they're so optimistic that they're really um, overstating the returns that the client's going to get. And so then they're, it's almost like I'm going to sell my that my client's investments because I can show for sure that this investment or if we go with this particular asset allocation model that I can show how I'm improving on their client situation. But it's really the underlying capital market assumptions that are kind of driving that result. So I was just wondering if anyone, because what I've been doing now is working with firms to try to under, help them understand if they use various capital market assumptions and we test a number of capital market assumptions, here's the result. And so now we can make an educated decision on which capital market assumptions really fit the risk of your firm. And I mean, because you can almost say that if you, you can kind of tweak the capital market assumptions and it will change the result of the plan. And therefore, is it really in the client's best interest? Now, I know nobody's doing that. We're all, you know, trying to use, you know, that's not what we do, but it can be a risk. I guess that's where I'm going with that. So I don't know if anyone has any um, experience with assessing their capital market assumptions or, you know, trying to make a decision about which ones are a best fit for their, for their firm and their clients. So we actually use our own internal research um, and they, they, they pour a ton of time and resources into it. Um, Paul, I think you said you're with Ray J. I know they have their internal resources as well, or internal research as well. So we just, we totally rely upon that. And then that drives all of our assumptions. And we create those consistent assumptions through our financial planning, through our investment advisory process. So we have that consistent approach, but um, to rely upon the rep to do any of that, no, we don't, we don't let the reps make those determinations. So, and then so, so Will, if, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ken. Will, will if, uh, if if I were to go to, to look at Money Guy Pro off the shelf, uh, what capital market assumptions built into that? Um, so if you're an independent advisor and you subscribe to our retail product, we offer a few different flavors. Um, they're created with the help of a consultant, Harold Evensky. So um, Evensky does his research, but um, the, the default capital market assumptions, which come in either historical or projected flavor, they're, they're not meant to tell people that this is what is going to happen uh, that, or that these are correct or that the portfolios we provide as a default are better than your research departments can provide. Um, they're just there as a starting point. And I would say um, all of our enterprise clients provide their own through those uh, internal departments uh, with their own research. So we, we're really subservient in that regard to the capital market assumptions that are used in the vast majority of enterprise instances of Money Guide. Um, within our independent space, um, I would estimate that a little over uh, half of our users modify or create their own. And, um, you know, doing that comes with a little bit of, of risk, as Lee stated. Uh, you have to make sure that what you're putting in there is reasonable. Um, you don't want to put in some sort of alternative category that has a really high 
uh, reward and really low risk, and then forget your constraints within portfolio. So not to go into the weeds, but we, we really do try to help people out and, and make sure that based on the, the categories of asset class that they're adding, that they don't let them run wild uh, under certain scenarios. But um, suffice it to say that what you choose for your capital market assumptions has an enormous impact on the Monte Carlo simulations yep. and the results of the plan. So it, it really is very important uh, that we help firms especially set those up in an appropriate way and kind of do a little bit of a, uh, a gut check against what other people are doing. I wanted to take a shift if that's okay with everyone. So, so actually Lee, we, uh, uh, <coughs> we have someone who's uh, raised their hand. Um, Warren, thank you for uh, thank you for doing so. I'm gonna you should, uh, get a note asking you to join join the panel. There you are. All right, Warren, I'm gonna make sure that you're that you're unmuted. It looks like you actually beat me to it. So uh, welcome and uh, shoot. Thank you uh, and and hello everyone. I've been listening carefully. Um, I just had some thoughts that came came to mind when we were talking about risk or uh, you were all talking about the risk scoring and all. I think there's, there's so many reasons why using these instruments are beneficial. First of all, it facilitates the conversation with the client so that you get an opportunity to learn about the client. The client has an opportunity to learn about you. And I've, I've picked up so much from clients just by listening when I ask a question and then I sometimes am surprised by the answer. Um, and, and, and about how they are defining risk and, and how they view risk uh, differently depending on what piles of money they're talking about within their, within their financial uh, picture. But how you define risk is important and, um, and, and making the differentiation between volatility and risk because those two are not the same thing. So, um, Real, realistically, the behavioral risk is, a, is as big a risk as anything else if you position the assets properly. Um, we've all seen people change their risk score after they've gone through a rather drastic uh, or sudden market episode and then they kind of come back and then they, 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 let me see that questionnaire again and they, and they you know, take it again. So this is a process that is ongoing and anything that we can do to facilitate conversations so that trust can develop. That, that client has to trust your judgment. Um, you have to trust that, that the rapport that you're building is strong enough to withstand all of the things that are gonna come over a long-term uh, relationship. I think using this the, a risk score tool as well and making sure that their existing portfolio is in line with that risk score um, as, as flawed as that may be, it's, it's still, it, it enables you to demonstrate that you're taking a disciplined approach to your business, that this isn't, uh, you're not taking a flyer, it's not, a, it's not, you know, it's not just a, uh, a one-time recommendation on something that you think is gonna go up, it's, it's a disciplined approach, um, it's gonna get adjusted over time, and with respect to the capital market assumptions, um, that's, that's a general guide. I think it's always been important to me to make sure that if I do the math for clients and we find out what type of return they're going to need in order to achieve their goal, now I have to, I have to foot it back. I have to reconcile that with what types of financial instruments have historically been able to deliver that return and which instruments have never been able to deliver that return or not enough, not often enough. And so all of these types of discussions, you have the opportunity to have, to have that discussion so that the client can develop that trust. It's always in the end about the process of, we're gonna, we're gonna allocate it, we're gonna make our projections, we're gonna check in at least once a year, we're gonna rerun our projections, we'll see if we're ahead or behind schedule, we're not gonna panic either way, if we're behind schedule, if we're ahead of schedule, we'll probably leave things the way it is. If we're behind schedule, now we can talk about some of those options. As Paul mentioned, do you want to work a little bit longer? Do you want to try to become a little bit more aggressive? Can you free up some cash flow? 
whatever it may be. But that's, to me, that's where, you know, the trust happens. And I think we would all agree that all successful investing is built on people acting on a plan with the right advisor. And a lot of failed or suboptimal results come when people are reacting emotionally to current events. I think one takeaway from what, what you said is that, you know, risk may actually be organic. It's not a, it's not a thing like your height uh, or your weight. Well, weight, I guess, is organic too. But, um, and, and, but only by constant interaction with, with the client are you able to, to uh, navigate successfully through that. Th th thanks, Warren. Uh, Lee, you were going to shift the yeah. discussion. I was going to, because um, what I wanted to talk about, you know, the uh, best interest came after DOL, right? And so the whole DOL was the idea that they, there was concern about rollovers. And so what I wanted to do is take a shift on how do we help advisors? I mean, we were trying to de determine it in the DOL timeframe is how do we know that a uh, a recommendation for a rollover is appropriate or not. And I've talked to a lot of advisors and I'm not so sure that they really um, can assess all of the underlying components, all, what's needed to know about rollovers. There's a lot of information there. So yeah. one of the things that I wanted to throw out is, you know, what are we doing what are we providing for advisors to help them assess whether a rollover makes sense for a client or not? And I'm not sure if Amanda, if you want to start and talk about what, because I was involved with what we did at BMO to try to determine, you know, whether a recommendation to roll over a 401k or qualified money was appropriate or not. I'd love to hear maybe an update of what BMO is doing as a start. So we, we, we did was we put together that rollover, um, questionnaire and recommendation document. And, and so we kept that after the DOL fiduciary rule went away. Um, we still kept that questionnaire and decision document. And, and it really is a, is a, it starts out with some baseline questions, some what we called knockout questions so that it would remove um, you know, it, if, if certain events were to take place or if they were to answer the question a certain way, then it would take them out of the, the rollover, um, excuse me, my son just walked through my camera, uh, then it would really take them out of the, the rollover, uh, you know, category for making that recommendation. I think one of the difficulties that we found was that um, one of the requirements was to compare uh, the the investments that were in the the four hundred one k portfolio versus the investment offerings that you had, and I think one of the difficulties that we came across during that that time period when we were looking at this was um, having access to the the um, investments that were in the the portfolio and then also the potential options for what those investments were if the client could stay within that portfolio and that's one one area where thinking ahead to you know the the proposed rule we haven't really solved for um in how to without the client actually providing you with a statement so i think that 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 is a, a challenge that we're still facing um, otherwise, it's really, you know, it, a lot of it comes down to cost um, of the different sort of the, um, the fees that you're paying in one versus the other. And then the other thing is whether or not you have access to um, financial planning and, and somebody to give you advice on that 401k plan if you have the option to stay in and what you're paying for that versus what you would pay um, at the new firm with the new financial advisor. And so I think those, those are the key elements that, that we really look at and that we still look at, even though you know, today I wouldn't consider us to be a fiduciary uh, in the rollover space. Now that's probably gonna change once this rule goes into effect. Um, so I hope that answers your question. If your advisors had 
access to an expert with that client's 401k, like if they had some, some better information on that, would you think that that would be advantageous? Would that be even, would that make the recommendation or the decision to roll over, uh, to recommend a rollover or not, if they have like an expert or a resource in their back pocket? You know, I, I think it could be useful for those who can stay within their 401k plan. Um, you know, it, it, but I would say the majority of people, you know, it really depends on where they're coming from, right? And whether or not they're able to stay in that 401k plan. So um, yes, in those situations, I think that it would be really helpful to, to be able to have that feed um, or to have somebody who is knowledgeable about the various 401k plans. But as we know, they're, you know, they're in the tens of thousands and it's really hard to, to be able to assess um, or, or to gain that information um, depending on the plan. Well, I know that's kind of how I've always looked at it too. It's just, it's such a big nut to crack, right? It's so, how do you, how do you get your arms around this? And um, I'm, I'm doing this, you know, kind of directly a little bit, but, you know, when I learned about the Retirement Learning Center, I was absolutely, you know, I just thought, why are, why isn't this more available? Um, because of, I think, the, some of what they can provide, which is really refreshing. And so I'm not, I don't want to attempt to try to describe what you're able to do, John, but if you could enlighten us, because I think there you there's really just um, a great opportunity to improve our ability to you know recommend make recommendations on rollovers and other retirement questions so maybe you could kind of I, I get it's kind of a little bit of a direct question but please you know share yeah, a little bit yeah I, I'm I you know it's always good to know somebody who sits on the government affairs committee for the American Society of Pension Professionals and Actuaries and I keep telling my family that and they continue to laugh at me but um, maybe for this type of a question it is relevant because you know um, we're an ERISA consulting firm we've been around you know 18 years we probably the folks on the phone your advisors probably call us through one of your asset management partners like Columbia Threadneedle funds or or Mass Mutual or somebody like that. Um, but uh, one of the spaces that we support advisor practices in is the rollover space. And there's nothing new about this really. FINRA 1345 has been around for a long time. Uh, and to the previous point, um, it's not just comparing the investments in the plan lineup, you have to compare the features. And I don't know if any of you have had, you know, the meet and greet with the SEC recently, but <clears throat> I talked to a good friend of mine and had one of the largest independent broker dealers, the head of ERISA compliance, he's a pal of mine. Um, that I've known forever and they've come in and they've said a couple of things. They said, number one, we're going to audit your rollover book of business because it's, I mean, how many assets are in the IRA rollover business? It's over $9 trillion. And I would ask yourselves in your broker dealer, where does the majority of your net new assets and net new clients come from? Um, it's gotta be in the top three. So, you know, it's like, why, you know, why do you rob banks? That's where the money's at and you're the banks. Um, so that's where your money's coming from. So that's the big focus is going to be here. And the big thing they're going to be looking at, Lee, to your point, is <clears throat> different really than the DOL stuff, is they're going to be looking at this conduct of care. Conduct of care is the big <clears throat> game changer uh, in the compliance side of rollovers. So the SEC is going to come and audit your book uh, of rollover business. They're going to be looking for process and procedure and recommendations. And this large independent broker dealer has never monitored the IRA rollover recommendation. They've monitored the asset recommendation where the money went after it was rolled over um, because they never got scrutinized. Now they're being told head on, they're gonna be scrutinized about process, procedure, recommendation. And then they said very clearly, they're gonna be looking for this conduct of care standard, which means that the advisor is gonna to have to demonstrate that they had a thorough mastery of the plan environment. And that's just not the investments, that's the features in the plan. Uh, and if you really wanna look in the IRA market, look how many of your assets come in through in-service non-hardship distribution provisions, which means there's not even a separation of service occurring. So you're gonna to have to demonstrate that the plan advisor had total mastery of the current plan environment, understood the IRA, no doubt the fees are gonna be higher, but there's a clear path and justification if you're following FINRA 1345, the services, the investment features, all this stuff can be justified if well-documented. But you're also gonna to have to compare if it's a job changer where the assets could have been rolled over to in the next company plan. 
Um, and Lee, that was kind of a softball for us, but we have, you know, we have, you know, 20,000 planned documents on file that we've amalgamated over the last 18 years for just this purpose, though, that our advisors who call us, they say, I'm in Atlanta. You know, well, we train them to be benefit specialists at Southern Company, Coca-Cola, Home Depot, Delta Airlines, RCN, Georgia Tech University, and a couple of big hospitals, as well as a litany of other small and mid-sized employers, because then number one, that's just the foundation of any good financial planning, understanding the concentrated wealth at work, but now it's a compliance requisite under Reg BI. So firms are going to have to solve for this uh, conduct of care. And it is, at least from what I'm hearing from, uh, from my government affairs work and, and the folks at uh, uh, one of the big independent broker dealers, it, it's where you're, it's where you're going to get audited first because it's the big uh, source of money. Uh, Connor, I see your smiling face there. Not smiling actually, but uh, you know, I see your face there. Uh, you, you run into this stuff probably more so than anybody. Yeah, we were actually just talking to uh, one of our larger uh, broker dealers and they said that they, they were one of the, what feels like must be a huge number of firms that are getting a little meet and greet uh, remotely. And I think uh, my suspicion is because the SEC can do things remotely, they're doing more than what they would normally do. And so they're in more places. And uh, the interesting thing is that they, they came away from, I guess, a part, it's not over yet. And they said that the, the warning that they got was that as closely as you, we monitor your VA sales for annuities, that's how close we're going to be on rollovers. And so they're, uh, I think they're pretty well prepared because they made a lot of changes during the DOL uh, take one the first time through that they've kept. Uh, but they know of a couple areas where they're going to, to beef things up. And I think, uh, yeah, it, it's certainly something that, uh, it is going to be on everybody's minds. Is it's it, like you said before, John? It was it's it's been something that uh, that hasn't had a microscope on it, and it's there now. And being able to document that you did what you were supposed to do under the conduct of care is going to be huge. And the easier that you can make that for your financial professionals, uh, I think the more likely that they are going to stay in doing rollovers. Uh, there's plenty of folks that. Um, we had one broker dealer who said we just never marketed for them. We didn't want to have to deal with it. We educated clients. We let them do whatever they want after that. I've heard that a number of times now. And I think that was a little bit of a, we don't want to get our hands on that because we know that there's, there's going to be some changes in the future. Uh, and now the way that the proposed DOL rule is written, it sounds like uh, you might get pulled into it whether or not you want to be. Um, so, John, I think your services are going to be in uh, high demand. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that, Connor. I, I certainly hope so. Uh, but, uh, it's, it's nothing, that, again, it's nothing that snuck up on us being ERISA nerds. Again, FINRA 1345 has been there forever. This is really what we're supposed to have, have been being done for a long time. We just had the DOL in charge of enforcement in the past, and they didn't resource it. So if they're not knocking on your door, you're not uh, monitoring uh, it, and now you got the SEC saying so. But I, I would say one thing, Connor, I don't know if you're seeing this, and, and you know, certainly for the folks on the line here, it's not, you know, if, if you have an understanding of the plan, um, I don't think this is, you know, I, and this is, again, that same uh, independent large broker dealer. They're actually viewing this as a net new opportunity. If they can train their advisors to be like ACO is in the, you know, executive benefit marketplace, if they can train their advisors to know the basics of the large market plans, mid market plans in their backyard, Number one, they're going to be doing better financial planning because there's so much concentrated wealth at work that people have in various workplace retirement plans across DBDC and non-qual. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an entree into financial planning. But once you have that mastery of it, the compliance aspect isn't that difficult as long as you have, you know, I know you have a rollover wizard. You know, folks go through the world of wizard. It's, you know, as long as you've got the process around it and you know where to get the feed and data to demonstrate that mastery of the plan where they were coming out of, uh, it's not that difficult. And I actually view it, uh, Lee, as one of the things you listed on your objectives today. What are the positives out of Reg BI? I think you could actually go, you know, go forward here and claim uh, thought leadership in this space, you know, as part of your financial planning uh, business that you include concentrated wealth at work. And it could be a uh, a proactive uh, business opportunity for you. So can I take like 30 seconds okay. and say something? Um, mm -hmm. Actually, we use the rollover wizard at Cetera. Um, so I got five broker dealers that I sit on top of. Um, we actually rolled it out at one of the broker dealers at the self-cleaning broker dealer first. Um, 
the benefit of Reg BI in utilizing the rollover wizard, we're actually making the process a lot easier for our reps. Um, we, we have all the forms, you know, so for broker dealers, I got all these stack of forms this high, you got to complete if you want to do a rollover and you have to have all the plan documents and yada, 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 where you do the rollover wizard, um, which just walks them through a series of questions. We get a report, um, makes the process so much easier. So uh, I'm not going to try and give away any pricing element because um, I want to make sure that Connor gives us a fair deal, but um, you know, try to look at how do we potentially roll that out to, you know, more of our reps if, if it works out. Another, another issue that we haven't, uh, hasn't come up yet is the controversy between the, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, CFP board and, uh, and the SEC in terms of the, uh, in terms of the uh, standard of care. And I, I'm kind of not, I've kind of lost track of where that has gone. I'm sure that people around the table could help me understand that. I think one of the challenges is that CFPs are held to higher standards. In fact, um, they write the new standard is that they are required to do a financial plan for all their clients. And if they don't do a financial plan, that they actually have to be able to defend why they didn't do a financial plan for that person. And so I think that's a challenge because I think that, um, you know, there's some conversation around, do we have to have additional supervision to supervise whether or not, you know, the CFPs did a plan for that person, or do we need to have different disclosures um, so I'd, I'd be interested to, in fact, there was even um, discussion at a meeting that I attended that talked about whether or not CFP, we would allow, whether banks were going to allow their advisors to continue to use their CFP designations or not. So yeah, I'd love to hear, you know, is anybody doing anything differently for CFPs? Let's maybe start there. Um, is anybody doing anything different for CFPs versus the rest of their, their advisors? Well, so I would say at BMO, when we looked at the CFP um, rules, which they are now under enforce, you know, they're not, the CFP board is now enforcing those rules. They delayed the, the enforcement of them to, to roll out at the same time as Reg BI. Um, we did not, make people get rid of their CFPs because we think that it's a benefit when somebody has a CFP um, and goes through that, that testing and training. Um, we did make sure that we have all the requisite CFP required disclosures on our documents and we just use the, the existing disclosures that we were handing out through the form CRS and the Reg BI and, and our account agreements um, and then we gave access to our clients as to where to search up to see if their advisor is a CFP or not. Um, otherwise, what we have done is it's the CFP um, as an individual has their responsibility to maintain their, their registration with the board. And, and so we do not take the stance of supervising their activities as a CFP. Um, and so I think a lot of firms were really struggling with this. Um, and a lot of the conversations that I had in, in rolling out, um, you know, our, our reg best interest compliance. Um, and a lot of firms that, um, that I talked to were, were really taking a similar approach that most firms were, that I talked to in the planning stages, were going to continue to allow their advisors to, to keep their CFPs. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody on this call came out with a different understanding, but, but I think it might be very few and far between of the firms that, um, that, that told their CFPs that they could no longer um, keep it or market themselves as a CFP. Yeah, it, it's John uh, Carl again from Retirement Learning Center. Just, uh, just as an FYI, we've been, we've been getting we're a CP, uh, we're, we're a CFP and CMS continuing education shop. So we've actually had a handful of broker dealer clients come to us because they're trying to create an avenue for their folks to get, uh, you know, their CE requisite credits. 
uh, and to try to integrate that with their firm message. So it is, it's, a, it's, it is, you're, it's, it's interesting. It's a hot topic and everybody's trying to, it seems to me there's multiple ways of skinning the cat right here, but it does seem that everybody's trying to maintain this whole CFP thing and how do you do it? And, you know, CE was one angle that we've, we've gotten multiple calls actually. I don't know whether this is something that's, it must be something that's going on right now, but we're getting multiple calls right now about firms trying to support CE, but tie it into their firm strategy um, and consistently. So I don't know if anybody else is hearing that. Amanda. I don't know which way it's going to go. Oh, sorry, Ken, go ahead. Go ahead. I, was gonna say, I, don't, I don't know which way it's going to go this time around, but the last time there were big changes, uh, that's when we saw tons of uh, insurance broker dealers pre present uh, CFPs. And so I think uh, it, it may be a matter of time before that comes to a head for other broker dealers. Uh, but I, I think that the CFP board, at least every year, they charge me more for marketing uh, to keep mine up. And I think they're going to continue to have to do more and more of that because for a while there, uh, they were the designation, but there's a lot of good designations now uh, that, that are more than just uh, letters that you get in, a, in an afternoon. So I think that if they continue down this track, they're going to find themselves at a competitive disadvantage. And I've seen enough high profile CFPs writing op-eds uh, to know that they, they might've overstepped a little bit. How big an issue is that really for banks though? I mean. Amanda, how many of your, um, uh, of your advisors are CFPs? We have a decent amount of advisors that are CFPs. Um, and we have a decent amount of our, uh, um, in the private bank space that, that handle um, private wealth investments um, are also CFPs. And so, you know, at least from the, the broker dealer that I support, and um, while we do encourage people to get their CFP, um, we don't pay for it for them. So it's 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 their requirement to obtain it and to um, and to pay for for the maintenance of it. Um, one of the things that we do is we just monitor our list of of who has it and verify that they actually have one before um, allowing them to use that designation. Mm -hmm. Paul, what 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 about you? Which in your shop, you have a lot. Yeah, of we've got about a similar story. We've got about a third of our folks who are CFPs, and and certainly you know support it. But uh, we also we also have a number of people who have taken the, the first step, and and they're actively waiting to see what what happens. Um, as am I. So you know, I'm I'm keenly listening to the comments that are being made on this on this topic, and trying to uh, listen to thoughts and discussions going on in, in other forms as well, just to, just to know what the right right answer is, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, we, we haven't really looked at that in a couple of years. Um, and uh, so we thought that we would take advantage of the people on the line and ask them about what kind of, how many of their advisors have, have, have uh, CFP or, or other kind of planning designations. So we, we thought we'd send this um, poll out to the everyone online. Tim, you can explain how this works? Sure, so uh, everyone should see uh, um, a poll question on, the, on their screen right now. The question is, how many of your firm's advisors have the CFP or some other planning certification? Um, if you could uh, fill that out, we'll, we'll uh, allow responses to roll in for a minute before we uh, and in the meantime, this is probably going to be a good opportunity to thank our sponsors again, you know, InvestMet, Money Guide, Capital Rock, the creators of Brightbridge, our Retirement Learning Center, Risk Allies, and of course, our good friends at uh, Midwood Financial who are bringing you today's meeting. All right, we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll give it another, uh, another 10 seconds or so. All right, Ken. Uh, can you uh, can you see the results on your screen? I can. But, um, there we go. There we go. I had to, I had to click one more button. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it looks like uh, no one no one in the audience uh, reports that 
that none of their advisors have a planning designation that 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 probably says a lot about the the type of firm that chose to tune in today. Mm -hmm. And that and then none of them have most of their of their uh, advisors with designations. It sounds like for among the people that are sitting around the virtual round table, about a third seems to be fitting with the rest of the audience out there. Thank you. Thanks everyone for uh, for completing that, that quick poll. Lee, what other issues do you have on, uh, up your sleeve? Um, well, I actually wanted to kind of hear a little bit about um, what maybe struggles people are having now with Reg BI. What, how is it going? What if, what's been unexpected? Um, are you know things going smoothly? That type of thing. Start. Um, I think. Well, I mean, it's it's a brand new rule, so um, I think part of the problem is just trying to figure out what the additional guidance is going to come out of it. You know, we did Reg BI version 1.0, and for all of us, it's going to evolve over the course of the next six months, 18 months, 24 months. Um, did we do enough on the rollover side? Not sure, um, but we know that's going to be a focus of the SEC. Uh, that's why we looked at the rollover wizard to use that from a tool standpoint. Um, it concerns me on the mutual fund side of the world. Um, to me, there's still a lot of conflicts within mutual funds when you start looking at all the different breakpoints uh, between the different fund families. Um, so there's there's still just a bunch of conflict within our industry that we have to try and resolve, and some of it's a it's a pretty big issue, and especially within mutual funds. And if you start looking at uh, broker dealers that have direct relationships for, with mutual fund companies. So I think that's going to be my biggest concern over the course of the next um, six months is just trying to figure out where we go from there from the SEC perspective. We, uh, we did have a question come in over, um, over chat, Lee. Um, this one comes from Tom, Tom Baldwin. Uh, he asks, I thought there were guidelines for CFPs surrounding financial planning versus non-financial planning advice. Anyone have, uh, have any insight on that? No, I, and I don't know if this is an answer to the question, but what they did was they expanded the standard of care from um, when you give a financial plan that you also have the same standard of care to when you're giving investment advice. Mm -hmm. One of the things um, that we might want to talk a little bit about is how do we pull this all together, right? Like we've got Connor. Smoke and mirrors? Pardon me? You mean smoke and mirrors? <laughs> like how do we get this, all this stuff to work together? I mean, are we just like bolting it on to, to what? I don't know. Maybe it's the, but I'm just trying to figure out how, are there ways that we can make this all work? Or are there any best practices about pulling it all together using a capital rock or, you know, some of the tools and resources that are now available <clears throat> to help us comply and help to do financial planning? And maybe Will could even speak to this a little bit. You wanna kick us off? Connor, I would say go ahead. You probably have um, a pretty good amount of insight on this stuff. Well, I was well, yeah. And when Will's referring to our many years working together when I was at when I was at Money Guide, so um, I, I'm actually going to take the opportunity to to brag back at, at Kevin because I think the best way to do that is to have a platform uh, that sews everything else together. And it sounds like Paul's got a, a great one through Ray J. But bottom line is, if you have a kind of that hub and spoke approach where maybe Salesforce or your CRM is the is the center, or your provided system is the center of uh, the financial professionals day and you're able to have systems that integrate well within it. I mean, I feel like the, the old adage of, of talking integration, we could go back 20 years and talk about how integration is going to help. And I think that you can use integration in a good way and you can certainly use integration in a not effective way. And it's certainly not effective to have one system integrate with another, with another, with another. But when you can sew it together into a platform like Soterra's done, where you've got a, a single place where you know where to go when you're doing certain types of business, and it doesn't matter where 
it takes you. It's always going to take you back to that centralized repository of both data and for that next step. I think that's why, Kevin, you probably had a, you know as much work as you put into best interest. I think that there are those that were that don't have a platform like you have that probably worked a lot harder and didn't get a result as smooth uh, as you know as it is. I think uh, one of the guys on my team just sent me an article that said this is uh, I think generic across all all of wealth management, but 40% of financial professionals uh, found themselves dissatisfied with their platform having to work remotely in those last couple of months. Uh, and I I think that. Uh, yeah, I, that's that's the bottom line for me is you, you can have the right tools in the tool shed, but putting them together is what's most important. Paul? I, I think the, the, the real key to this whole thing, um, especially as I've had experience building this out, everybody's going to be compliant, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a level playing field for that because we're, we're, we're forced to be compliant. But the differentiator going forward is going to be the client experience. And I would say really you want to build out that client experience and anything that detracts from that client experience or doesn't allow you to deliver that client experience, figure out a way to outsource it, figure out a way to, to, uh, to get back to what's important, which is, is taking care of the client. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm without going into too many details, I, I know that situation comes up where you can just put too much effort, too much on the, on the, um, on the compliance side, not not enough on the the client experience side. But at the end of the day, that's why we're doing this. Is it is there tension between the advisor experience and the client experience, or are they naturally aligned in terms of a seamless experience for each of them? Well, when you have competing resources, um, that that gets tough. But but when when your clients are being taken care of, you, you have a happy sales force and, and happy financial advisors. When you're missing something, like, like I said, when you're spending too much on the administration of the business and not enough on the, the sales and, and client relationship management side, then, then you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the DOL, I think we all, I was pretty excited about it, to be honest, because I thought this is great. It's an opportunity for advisors to do more planning and that, and overall, I've just been so passionate about financial planning. So I thought this was absolutely fabulous. But still, we continue all the all the data we have says that financial advisors still are not adopting it at a rate that they should be adopting it. So, Paul, I just I do want to throw it back to you for a second and just say, you know, I'm hoping that Reg BI will help. Uh, we can leverage Reg BI to help get more planning. But I know you've had a lot of success. Um, at seeing some real growth in financial planning. And I thought it'd be great to maybe end up with something like that because I do believe it's about the client and the, and the experience they have. So could you kind okay. of share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'll just leave, leave a, a quick thought. It's kind of one of those best practice nuggets for those who've uh, stayed on to the very end. But, but I, I think ultimately, this is, this is the question that, that we like to ask our clients, which is, you know, in a situation where they have, have family and they want to take care of their family, we, we often say, which would you prefer? Would you prefer to leave your children a lot of money? Or would you prefer to leave your children with a lot of memories and life experiences with you? And to tell you the truth, it doesn't matter how they answer, but it is fun hearing their answer and you get a lot of information about the client because at the end of the day, what financial planning does, it allows us to do both. And that's the fun part is when you can say, you know what, I actually think we can do both and here's how we can do it. And, and you just do it through the form of financial planning process. So again, I, I just emphasize financial planning as a process is the best client experience and, and everything from a regulatory and sales and, and client experience and successful financial advisors who feel like they're growing, it, it just ties it all together. Thank you, Paul. But it looks like we've come to the end of our time. Uh, want to thank those of you sitting around the virtual roundtable for, for your uh, conversation and for the people who, who, who dialed in and, uh, and, and, and sat through this. We, we appreciate uh, your, your attention. Uh, want to thank our sponsors again, Invest, InvestNet Money Guide, 
Capital Rock, Retirement Learning Center, Risk Allies, and of course, uh, our friends at Mid and Woodward Financial for their support. Um, our next meeting uh, will be September 22nd, where we're gonna be looking at uh, our, our new research on the state of financial planning and financial institutions. Um, and then October 15th, uh, we will be running a symposium on our uh, new uh, service benchmarking planning activity at the advisor level called uh, uh, Planning Insights. So hopefully you'll join us for both meetings, September 22nd and October 15th, and you'll undoubtedly be hearing from us about those. Thanks again for participating. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all. Thanks. Bye. Bye.